you've heard all about um, epic, at least the, the greatest epic uh, in literature, uh, certainly in Greek literature. Uh, I'm going to be talking about myth. And uh, myth has a different kind of narrative structure. Uh, mythic storytelling is very different from other forms of storytelling. And one of the most important ways is that, in principle, everybody's already heard the story before. So the narrative skill lies in unfolding, less in unfolding the story uh, than in bringing its parts together in a kind of meaningful resonance. The knowledge that everyone knows the story allows the storyteller to bring the past and the future into the narrative moment in a way that's not possible with other story forms. I'll show how this is done with the story of Achilles, whose end is always present in his beginnings and whose beginnings bring meaning to his end. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to point out that the ancients did not distinguish between myths and other genres like uh, epic, drama, or painting. Myth is the story that's narrated by these genres. The wonderful thing about myth is its flexibility. It can be contracted into a brief elemental tale, or it can be stretched out to fill several long epics. In painting, a whole story can be concentrated into a single scene to be appreciated in one glance. Even in a long epic like the Iliad, where the story focuses on a few days and the single theme of the wrath of Achilles, as you've just heard, the narrative still evokes the whole story of the Trojan War. Whether a myth is told long or short, its entirety can be made significantly present at any given moment. Okay, now to Achilles. He's, uh, as you've just heard, one of the great, greatest heroes of Greek epic. And technically, a hero uh, in Greek myth is someone who's born of a mortal parent and an immortal parent. Yeah? Uh, this makes great heroes like Achilles virtually godlike, except in one very important respect. Unlike the gods, heroes are mortal. Tales of the gods are the stuff of comedy. But the mortality of heroes is what gives epic its grandeur and tragedy its sting. I'll try to show how the story of Achilles' birth implicates his death. In fact, I'll start with the story of his parents' wedding told in a single picture and show how it implicates our consciousness of the hero's eventual doom. Now, Achilles' Achilles's parents are Peleus and Thetis, and their wedding was generally reckoned the first episode of the Trojan War. Uh, this is where the now lost epic, the Cypria, that you heard about uh, just uh, now, begins, and the Cypria, as you heard, is, was made the first uh, epic in the Trojan cycle. Uh, many of our earliest narratives in Greek art are uh, based on the Cypria. And let me see if I can, uh, as is um, this uh, wonderful vase, uh, now unfortunately very fragmented, um, called the Francois vase. Um, it was painted in the early 6th century, and like other early representations, it shows the procession of the gods that were invited to the wedding of Peleus and Thetis. Uh, and you can see how they're moving uh, towards uh, Pele uh, Peleus' house. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, there's, uh, there's Peleus. Uh, he's out in front, ready to greet the gods as they come to the wedding. Right in there, you can see it better in the, the drawing beneath, is Thetis. Uh, she's sitting inside the house, not greeting the gods like the others, and many take this as a sign of feminine modesty, uh, but I think there's another possible interpretation, a better one. She is, in fact, brooding. Uh, like her son Achilles, she sulks, but she sulks for her entire life after she meets uh, Peleus. Uh, and so 
uh, Achilles is sulking uh, is a bit of a chip off the old block. All right? So the most important characters uh, in this story are um, how are Achilles' parents. A and these images here, as I'll show, are a good example of how beginnings and endings are implicated together. And part of our uh, immediate momentary consciousness in dealing with a mythic narrative. Yeah. Peleus is out greeting the gods as they arrive. Uh, Thetis inside the house. But Thetis is, despite the fact that she's barely visible here, she's largely present uh, by her absence. Uh, and yet she is the most important character in the story. Why is she brooding? Thetis is a goddess. She is the most important daughter of the sea god Nereus. Zeus himself once courted her, but Prometheus told Zeus about a prophecy uh, that Thetis was destined to give birth to a son who was greater than his father. And Zeus, putting this together with another prophecy that he heard, that his own son would uh, would overpower him and become king of the gods in his stead, putting two together, two and two together, uh, he uh, decided that he would not, in fact, rape Thetis. Uh, um, so she's not one of his 130 rape victims that we know of from myth uh, mythology. Uh, but instead, he would give her uh, as a bride to a mortal, uh, which would uh, offer no real threat to him, okay? So um, Zeus um, decided that this mortal should be Peleus. Uh, he chooses Peleus because Peleus had a reputation for rectitude and piety. Now, though Thetis resisted Zeus's advances, Thetis had a special relationship with Zeus, and she did him important favors. The Iliad mentions that Thetis rescued Zeus at a time when all the other gods were, and goddesses were plotting against him uh, to overthrow him. And Thetis is said to have brought up the hundred-hander Briarius from Hades uh, to protect Zeus and save him. For her services, Thetis might have deserved better of Zeus, but instead... He makes her endure what any goddess would regard as the ultimate disgrace. She becomes the wife of a mortal. Most of our sources present this as a precaution on Zeus's part rather than a punishment. Zeus, namely, wanted to make sure that Thetis' uh, husband was not one of the gods. However, both Hesiod and the Cypria seduce, suggest that Zeus gave Thetis to a mortal in revenge for her refusal to have sex with him. She suffers the ultimate disgrace, a marriage at the very bottom of the sociological scale, a marriage with a mortal. Thetis remained bitter with Zeus. In the Iliad, um, Iliad uh, 18, in conversation with Hephaestus, she complains. Uh, I'll read the lines to you. Hephaestus, is there anyone of all the goddesses on Olympus who has endured as much debilitating grief in her heart as Zeus, the son of Cronos, has given me? On me, of all the sea goddesses, he forced a mortal man, Peleus, the son of Iacus, and I endured intercourse with a mortal utterly unwilling though I was. It seems that even at the time of the wedding, the relationship between Thetis and Peleus was hostile and abnormal. Sophocles refers to it as a voiceless marriage. In fact, some of our sources suggest that the first words ever spoken between them less than a year, in some versions, after their marriage, well, Achilles was a mere infant, were words of anger and that these words ended the relationship. 
It is not just that Thetis had to endure the indignity of marriage to a mortal well below her station. The greatest cause of grief for Thetis is the foreknowledge that she will have to endure the pain of experiencing the death of her child. Yeah? In, in, in Greek mythology, um, the mortal gene is always dominant. Right? So, uh, however godlike the children uh, of a mixed marriage between gods and mortals may be, it, the, the heroes are always mortal. There are two quasi exceptions to this rule. Um, one is Dionysus, uh, who, uh, though he was born of a mortal mother, uh, when he was still in the womb, uh, Zeus uh, uh, fried a assembly with uh, a bolt of lightning, but took the fetus out and actually gestated it in his own thigh. Uh, so in a sense, he's about three quarters uh, immortal. Uh, uh, and then the other exception is Heracles, who was born mortal, but because of his great deeds, was made uh, immortal, paradoxically, ironically, at the moment of his death. All right? Um, so, um, Thetis has reason to hope, but really little reason, if you look at the matter statistically. But to make things worse, Thetis is clairvoyant. This is um, a typical characteristic of um, minor sea deities, like the old men of the sea, uh, who include Nereus, who is the father of Thetis, and their daughters. Right? Uh, they're all shapeshifters, and they have the ability to inhabit all forms, um, and this is somehow connected to their gift of second sight. In art, the different creatures into which they turn are sometimes shown together in a single body, a technique that's called synoptic narrative. You can see the lion, the snake, uh, and uh, various other uh, beings uh, mixed together in that form. Right. Proteus is an old man of the sea. We meet him in the fourth book of the Odyssey, uh, where uh, Menelaus tells the story of how he had to sneak up on uh, Proteus while he was asleep and then hold on to him as he went through a whole cycle of transformations, which included lion, a snake, a leopard, a boar, and even water, which I, I, I still have trouble getting my head around. He kept his grip on Proteus uh, until Proteus, exhausted, returned to the original shape, uh, which was that of a seal, in fact, uh, when uh, the wrestling match began, and only then was he willing to tell Menelaus uh, what he wanted to know, which was namely how Menelaus could get home. Um, we meet uh, Thetis's father, uh, Nereus, in, uh, in the Heracles myth. Uh, Heracles, in his 11th labor, had to wrestle with Nereus and hold on to him uh, while he went through his whole cycle of transformations and return to his original form. And uh, because Heracles was able to hold on, uh, he was able to find out from Nereus how to find the Garden of the Hesperides. Thetis is also a shapeshifter and also clairvoyant. And so she has more than an inkling that her child will be mortal. It's not just statistical probability, but premonition. Uh, Zeus knew uh, that uh, she would not consent to marry Peleus. So we have the centaur Chiron, Peleus' mentor, instruct Peleus on how best to rape her. Luckily, Peleus was a good wrestler. In fact, his name in Greek means the wrestler, and he has a personal history of wrestling with women, as you can see on these uh, vase images where he's wrestling with Atalante uh, for the prize of the hide of the Caledonian boar. Wrestling skills are definitely needed for catching Thetis because like her father, she has the power 
as I said, to transform herself into the shape of different beasts and natural elements. So uh, Chiron uh, advised Peleus to ambush Thetis on a peninsula in Thessaly, which is called uh, Cape Sepia. Uh, that is Cape Squid, if translated. There, whenever the moon was full, Thetis would emerge from the water with her sister Nereids, and they would dance around an altar. Chiron advised Peleus to hide himself behind this altar and then grab Thetis as she danced by. Sophocles, uh, in one of his uh, fragments, mentions that Thetis transformed herself into a lion, a snake, fire, and water. And other literary sources add wind, bird, tree, tiger, and finally a squid. Uh, interestingly enough, um, this wrestling match is also technically uh, rape in the modern sense of the word because we're told that it is as a squid that she actually conceived Achilles. Uh, so Thetis has every reason to be unhappy uh, with Peleus and still more to be gloomy about the prospects of her child. At the wedding, things turn out to be even bleaker than she foresaw. Achilles is not even going to live the meager span of a normal mortal life. It's at the very wedding celebration that the birth and early death of Achilles are announced. We don't know for sure who does the announcing, uh, but it is a very good bet that it is uh, one or all of the four fates who are prominent near the very end of the line of wedding guests on the Francois vase. The announcement of the youthful death of the child at the wedding of the parents is a narrative ancestor of the tale of Sleeping Beauty, which I'm sure you all know. There's an evil fairy who, like Strife, was uh, uninvited to uh, the wedding, but came nevertheless, at least in the, uh, it's a christening party uh, in so the version of um, Sleeping Beauty. Um, but uh, like uh, Sleeping Beauty, uh, the, uh, the fate um, announces not only the birth of the child uh, Achilles, but also his early death. Uh, in the Sleeping Beauty tale, uh, one of the three good fairies then makes the curse conditional. The death will be a deep sleep which can be ended with true love's first kiss. Right? In the Cypria too, Achilles' early death is made conditional. Achilles can have a long and happy life uh, if he lives in obscurity, that is, provided he does not go to Troy. If he does go to Troy, he will win immortal glory, but uh, he will also die young. The possibility that Achilles is doomed to be short-lived becomes an obsession with Thetis. Thetis does everything that she possibly can to prevent her child from fulfilling his, uh, his premature fate. When Achilles is an infant, Thetis does several things to make him invulnerable. Uh, for example, uh, you all know the story about Thetis dipping Achilles into the river Styx to make his flesh invulnerable. Uh, or when he comes of age, uh, you possibly know the story that uh, Thetis had Achilles hidden in Skyros uh, in a, a distant uh, and uh, inaccessible island uh, so that he wouldn't be drafted into the Greek army, but she also dressed him up as a girl and hid him amongst the 50 daughters of King Lycomedes so that he wouldn't be found. And were it not for the cleverness of Odysseus and Diomedes, uh, he wouldn't have been found, but they came disguised as merchants uh, carrying various things of interest to uh, young girls, like uh, nice clothing and makeup, but they also came with some arms and armor. And then somebody uh, called a clarion call, uh, making them think that the enemy was attacking the gates, and Achilles threw off his dress uh, and uh, grabbed the uh, 
um, the arms to uh, defend the city and ex exposed himself uh, literally and figuratively uh, as, uh, as male. So uh, once uh, Achilles is caught and forced to fight, uh, you uh, all heard that uh, Thetis also has Hephaestus make uh, impenetrable armor for Achilles, uh, again, to ward off this possibility of an early death. Um, and uh, just about everything that Thetis does, it backfires. Right? Uh, Thetis tries very hard to prevent Achilles from his early death, uh, but often the very things she does somehow perversely lead to that death. Uh, for example, her leaving the marriage with Peleus makes Peleus realize that he can't bring up this infant by himself, so he sends Achilles off to boarding school, uh, namely the centaur Chiron has a boarding school for heroes uh, on Mount Pelion. Uh, Heracles attended the school, uh, and uh, so did Jason. Uh, but it is at the school of uh, Chiron that Achilles learned valor and military arts and was instilled with a longing for glory that made him opt for the short and glorious life. In Troy, uh, when Achilles is insulted by Agamemnon, you've all just heard the story, he withdraws from battle and plans to leave Troy, almost happy for the excuse to return home and lead a long, happy, but undistinguished life. Thetis goes at his request to ask Zeus to favor the Trojans so that all the Greeks will resent Agamemnon's mistreatment of Achilles. But this only encourages Achilles' friend Patroclus to put on Achilles' armor in order to prevent the Trojans from actually setting fire to the Greek ships. Uh, and uh, he, when he joins the battle, Hector thinks that it is Achilles and so kills him. Uh, and it is to avenge Patroclus that Achilles then finally returns to the battle. Even Thetis's dipping of Achilles into the infernal river Styx in order to make him invulnerable is frustrated because Apollo guides Paris's arrow uh, in the, uh, the, um, uh, the Iliu Persis uh, to a point uh, where his mother held him at his, uh, on his foot, uh, the Achilles heel, so-called, and so he's then killed, right? The imagery of the Francois vase alludes to the early death of Achilles, uh, even in the marriage ceremony. Uh, one of the first guests to appear is Peleus's mentor and Achilles's great-grandfather, the centaur Chiron. He's carrying an ash tree as a wedding gift, and you can see, you can just make out uh, the ash tree there, it's uh, covered with, uh, with, with game that the centaur has caught uh, and other contributions to the wedding feast. Uh, but it is the ash tree itself, which is, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, uh, which is particularly interesting uh, because it uh, becomes the spear of Achilles. Uh, once it is smoothed by Athena, and fitted with bronze by Hephaestus. This is a clear sign that Achilles is doomed to take up the short, glorious life of a warrior, even though the story seems at this point to offer an alternative. There's another ambivalent gift brought by Dionysus. Now, Dionysus brings an amphora of wine, which is just totally appropriate for Dionysus and for a wedding feast. But uh, this particular amphora becomes kind of an heirloom in the family, and it is the urn in which Achilles' ashes will eventually be deposited. Right? Uh, so uh, the symbolism uh, is highly ambivalent, uh, and it uh, alludes to the final uh, death of Achilles. So these symbols and the images of the four fates and the image of 
that is brooding stress the ominous character of the scene. It is the beginning of an ill-fated, short-lived marriage which will produce an ill-fated and short-lived child. We know a little bit more about the story and unhappy marriage of Peleus and Thetis. In fact, it looks as if some of our earliest sources ascribe several children to the marriage, of whom the others died even younger than Achilles. Apart uh, from Homer and uh, the Cypria, the oldest version of the story comes from an epic poem called the Aegimios, possibly written by Hesiod. We know this 7th or 6th century epic from a summary, and it tells us that Thetis had several children by Peleus, but because she was afraid they might be mortal, she tested them by putting them in boiling water. This, of course, settled the question once and for all in the negative, where it killed them immediately. Achilles was only saved by the intervention of Peleus. This is what the summary says. Yeah? The author of the Aegimius in his second book says that Thetis put all the children she had by Peleus into a cauldron of water because she wished to know if they were mortal. Others say that she put them into fire. And indeed, when many had died, Peleus became enraged and prevented Achilles being thrown into the cauldron. Another brief summary tells us just a little more. The poet of the Aegimius says that Thetis threw her children by Peleus into a cauldron of water because she wished to know if they were mortal. Others say fire. And when many had perished, Peleus got angry. It took him a while. Uh, and prevented Achilles being thrown in the cauldron and that Thetis left him because of this. But Sophocles, in The Lovers of Achilles, says that Thetis abandoned Peleus when she was scolded by him. So here we learn that Peleus' angry reproach to Thetis for killing the other children in this very stupid way and almost killing Achilles in the same way made Thetis leave. Uh, we recall that Sophocles said uh, earlier in a fragment that I showed you that it was a voiceless marriage. And now we are possibly to suppose that the first words spoken between the married couple after at least a year, or in some versions of this tale, many years of marriage were words of anger, and that put an immediate end to the marriage. Uh, but later, antiquity was not entirely happy with this story. For one thing, it made Thetis seem just a bit too stupid. To have killed one child in a failed experiment to see if it was mortal is bad enough, but then to repeat the experiment several times is just over the top. Huh? Um, later tradition changed Thetis' motive for cooking her children. It adopted a story motif which is quite common in Greek mythology, uh, where children are cooked, uh, usually cooked by um, goddesses or by witches, uh, in order to cook off their mortality and to make them immortal. This is what Demeter does, for example, in the hymn to Demeter. She comes to Eleusis in disguise and becomes the nurse of the infant son of the queen of Eleusis. And in secret, uh, every night, she takes the baby and roasts it in the fire. Uh, and then uh, during the day, she embalms it with ambrosia. And one night, uh, the queen sees her child in the fire and screams, and this aborts the magic. And so Demeter, in a rage, sometimes we're told that she actually threw down the baby uh, and stomped off, uh, uh, chastising the mother for having ruined the, her attempt to make the child immortal. Um, and uh, um, we have a similar uh, version of this uh, myth in... Um, uh, in Apollonius's Argonautica, um, where Apollonius writes, she, referring to uh, Thetis, who uh, 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 appeared in the, in the waves and spoke very briefly to uh, Jason, who's on the Argonautic ship, uh, says, um, she, Thetis, spoke 
and then vanished into the depths of the sea. But a terrible pain struck Peleus, for he had not seen her since the day she left her bridal chamber and marriage, when she became enraged for the sake of her noble son Achilles, then a baby, for she used regularly to burn off his mortal flesh with the flame of fire in the middle of the night. And during the day, she anointed his tender body with ambrosia so that he would become immortal and so that he could keep disgusting old age, she could keep disgusting old age from his body. But Peleus leapt up from his bed and noticed his dear child writhing in the flame, and he uttered a fearful cry at the sight. Fool that he was! When she heard it, Thetis snatched the baby up and threw him screaming to the ground, and she, like a puff of wind, like a dream, fled swiftly from the house and jumped into the sea in anger, and she never came back again. In most stories of goddesses cooking off mortality, the goddess puts the patients in the fire. Demeter does this, so does Isis. But there are similar cases to that of Thetis and Achilles where boiling water is used. Uh, this is, for example, what happens in the story of Medea. Uh, Medea, you'll know uh, probably because she killed her children, but she also used to cook people young again. And she had many people that she cooked young again in a cauldron. Uh, and uh, the idea uh, is precisely uh, that she would cook off their mortality in boiling water. Um, but uh, so cooking people um, young and cooking people immortal uh, are not exactly the same thing, but uh, in, in mythical terms, they are pretty close. Um, in most um, stories, um, goddesses cooking uh, off mortality um, do this um, using uh, fire or boiling water. But it's easy to see uh, that we've got a variation of this story in the story of uh, Thetis Drop, dipping Achilles in the river Styx. Right? The Styx is a river of the underworld, as, and as in Mesopotamian and other myths, the waters of the underworld are death to, for mortals to touch. They're corrosive, and uh, they damage mortal flesh as surely as fire or boiling water. Uh, but but di by divine and magical means, uh, this corrosive water can be used to burn off mortality, uh, and uh, it's similar uh, to that uh, uh, practice that we know from Demeter, Isis, and, uh, and Medea. The rise and popularity of the story of dipping Achilles in the sticks is often attributed to the growing influence of Christian doctrine. Uh, the story is, in fact, especially popular on Christian grave monuments and other Christian art. Uh, and uh, this is because to early Christian eyes, the myth was an allegory of death and salvation beyond the grave. Uh, here are a couple of Christian monuments where you can see uh, that Thetis dipping uh, Achilles in the water and uh, these uh, women with pots overturned and water running out are personifications of of rivers. Right? Um, the, uh, it's especially favored at this time because of the similarity between this rite and baptism and the myth's meaning it can easily be adjusted to Christian theology, uh, which is what, in fact, uh, the church father Tertullian does when he describes the baptism of Achilles as a pagan attempt to wash away death. The mystic Christian Gnostics are in fact known to have practiced baptism in the river Acheron, which is a river in western uh, Greece, which was imagined to flow into the Acherusian Lake, which is a lake of the underworld in which rivers of, of water and rivers of fire mingled uh, together in the underworld. Uh, but Christian practice was in fact not responsible for the development of the myth. Baptism was not exclusively nor even originally Christian. Baptism or baptism-like ceremonies 
are attested for Bacchic rites from classic times and for the Hellenistic Isis cult and Roman Mithras. They all seem to offer immunity from the mortal condition. The baptism of Achilles in Styx is just a variant of the dipping of Achilles into a cauldron of boiling water. Uh, even when Christianity began to dominate the ancient world, the motif remained explicitly pagan. This mosaic in Paphos, for example, uh, shows an entirely pagan cast. Uh, if you can read Greek, you can see there's uh, Thetis, Peleus, uh, the three fates here, uh, now reduced to only three, and uh, Achilles, you can see Aki there, uh, and this is his upbringing. And this lady who's bringing the water in which he's going to be baptized is called uh, she who brings back to life, the reviver. And you can see this is not steam. This is damage to the mosaic. But you can see the, the movement of the water. It's rapidly boiling. Right? Uh, so um, the nurse, um, uh, we've got uh, here... Uh, a version of the Achilles story. Uh, but if you look at this character, Anna Trophé, and, and compare this with another mosaic, also in Paphos, the same city, uh, you'll see uh, that the baptism of Dionysus has a very similar kind of uh, schema and uh, a similar cast of characters. So uh, here's upbringing. Uh, there's a a woman not named, in this case, just nymphs, right, uh, bringing the water, and Dionysus uh, himself about to be baptized in this way. Yeah. So, um, it looks uh, pretty likely that the imagery associated with the baptism of Achilles is mainly influenced by the iconographic tradition for Dionysus's first bath that goes back to the first century BC. The story of Thetis boiling the baby in a cauldron seems to have been revived with a Dionysian, not a Christian bias, and the dipping the baby in sticks is no more than a variant. But both the mystic Dionysian and Christian traditions treated the bath as a symbolic washing away of mortality, huh? as the, the water carrier uh, and abusa uh, symbolizes. Uh, the best known version of the myth of Achilles' death makes a kind of backward reference to the episode of Thetis dipping the baby in the river Styx. According to this version, uh, Thetis dips Achilles in the waters of the river. As, uh, in the river Styx, not in order to make his flesh immortal, but uh, to make his flesh invulnerable. But Achilles had to be held somewhere, and the part of the foot where Hephaestus held him failed to be immersed in the water and remained vulnerable. So the story goes that at Troy, Apollo guided Paris's arrow towards the only part of Achilles' body that was vulnerable, and this is how Achilles died. Now, the expression, Achilles' heel, is proverbial for the weak point in an otherwise unassailable, watertight, or impeccable project, system, or personality. Achilles' heel is, however, a mistranslation for talus Achilles, uh, which means Achilles' ankle. Clearly, the ankle is a safer place if you're going to hold a baby upside down uh, to hold it. Uh, and it becomes, it acquires the meaning heel from late Latin, uh, where talus kind of migrates uh, from the ankle to the heel, as attested by uh, the French for um, uh, heel, talon, or Italian talone. But the story of Achilles' death, though it nicely brings together his birth and death in a single narrative moment by an arrow is not very satisfactory. An arrow in the ankle is usually not enough to kill the average person, let alone an epic hero. Right? Um, it's sometimes assumed for this reason 
that Paris used poisoned arrows, but we have absolutely no evidence from antiquity that this was the case. Um, this version of Achilles' end, though it was the most popular in later antiquity, is not attested in either art or literature before the end of the first century AD. On the contrary, earlier art uh, shows the dead Achilles with Ares, uh, arrows sticking out of him just about everywhere, showing that his flesh is clearly not invulnerable. Besides, we saw that Thetis's purpose in dipping Achilles into the waters of death was to make him immortal originally, not invulnerable. And in the earliest sources, at least, this attempt failed. Interestingly, we have an early version of the story of Achilles' death that makes his ankle not his weak point, but his strong point. An ancient variant tells us that Thetis put Achilles into the fire feet first, and then uh, uh, Peleus intervened and pulled uh, Achilles out of the fire, but it was too late to save his ankle bone, which was already burnt. And so to provide a substitute, uh, they called upon Chiron, and Chiron dug up the skeleton of the giant Demisus, the fastest runner amongst all the giants, and extracted the ankle bone and fitted it to the ankle of Achilles. This made Achilles swift-footed beyond all other men. This version also helps us to see a different motive for Apollo guiding Paris's arrow to Achilles' foot is to slow him down so that another more lethally directed arrow has a chance of killing him. So in the end, despite every effort that Thetis makes, uh, to the contrary, the prophecy is fulfilled and Achilles dies after a very short but glorious life. It's worth noting that Thetis eventually does succeed in making Achilles immortal or nearly so. This is done by a reverse process to that which ensured his mortality. We're told that just as Peleus uh, saved Achilles by, uh, by pulling him out of the fire, uh, so Thetis pulled uh, uh, Achilles' body from its funeral pyre uh, and transported it to the Isle of Luce, the White Isle. So she, she took him uh, to the White Isle where we're told uh, that Achilles lived on in a blissful and tranquil afterlife. And by about 600 BC, the White Isle is located in the Black Sea. And in fact, we have archeological evidence from the Black Sea to show that there were cults of Achilles uh, and uh, these can be identified with his final resting place. So to conclude, one of the special narrative qualities of myth is that the story is known to its audience before the telling. This excludes first-timers, of course, but the main myths were known even to children from a very early age. The myth-teller can draw upon the listener's knowledge, alluding to the end when telling the beginning and to the beginning when telling the end. The whole structure of a myth can be condensed, condensed into a single narrative moment. Indeed, most of our poets feel no need to relate the whole story. They evoke a myth with a few words, symbols, or images. It is um, just as often a synoptic as linear form of narrative. So it is with the stories of Achilles' beginnings, which foreshadow his ends, and the story of his end, which evokes his beginnings. The pain of his death is present already at his parents' wedding and his baptism, and Thetis' constant and vain attempts to stop the inevitable uh, sustain the knowledge of impending doom that dogs the narrative until its end. And that's the end. Yeah.